Hi everyone, welcome back to Life is Love School. Today's topic is self-sabotage and specifically, why do we self-sabotage and then what are the ways that we can overcome self-sabotage? I'll give you six tips, but let's start with the why. I don't know if you can relate to this, but for me personally, the more important and more meaningful something is to me, oftentimes the more likely I am to self-sabotage. By that I mean if I have an assignment that's due, a work assignment, a school assignment, I'm more likely to procrastinate by watching Netflix videos. Or if I have to make a decision on a relationship, a career choice, I'm more likely to start cleaning the bathroom. Basically, I would put obstacles in front of me instead of focusing on doing what I should be doing. I do something else, so I procrastinate. So this is a common behavior. I know that I'm not alone because when I lead discussion with the uh, women's only coaching group, this question comes up all the time. Like, why do we do this type of thing to ourselves? I think there are a couple different reasons. I'll just list the most common ones. So number one is control. So it may sound counterintuitive, but because we feel that we cannot control the success, we could be studying, pulling all-nighters, taking notes, doing everything we should do as a good student, for example, but still not do very well on a test. So we feel like the success is not something we can control, but guess what? We can control failure. We can absolutely control failure by not showing up for class, not doing the homework, not turning in assignments, not studying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So control itself gives us a certain level of comfort. So even if that result is not what we want, there is comfort in that. So then we feel like, well, you know, I'm not actually stupid or incompetent. I only got a D because I did not study. I think for many of us, our deepest fear is to try our very best and feel that you know our very best is still not good enough. And that could feel very devastating. So oftentimes then we choose to actually just not do the work and get the result, which is negative. The other thing is that we might feel like, well, you know, the higher we climb, the further we have to fall. So this is the old saying of some people just can't handle success. So you might see that in children's behavior. When you watch a child trying to walk, the first time they suddenly realize they're able to walk on their own without holding onto a rail, when they reach that moment of realization, they look at, back to their parents and usually they immediately fall on their butts. So whenever I think about this type of behavior where we feel like we can't handle success, that toddler walking comes to my mind. Another reason that people self-sabotage is a lack of self-worth. If we feel like we do not deserve success or we do not deserve happiness, the imposter syndrome is going to hit us hard and that we want to return back to the place we believe we should be, which is failure, not being successful, etc. So this is especially true for people that grew up in an environment where you were maybe pigeonholed as a failure, as a scapegoat, as not being good enough. If you're seeing success in your life, it could feel very uncomfortable because there's a strong level of cognitive dissonance. And what happens when we feel that reality and how we feel about ourselves is not matching is we tend to want to make them fit each other. So we either change how we see ourselves, which is rather difficult, or we return to what we feel is comfortable, which is we fail ourselves. So that's another common trap is if we don't feel that we deserve something, then we could do things as self-sabotage. Another one is very common also for trauma survivors is just sheer boredom. So when you grow up in trauma, what happens is your brain is flooded with glucocorticoid, cortisone, basically stress hormones that is circulating all throughout your brain. It may feel at the moment somewhat uncomfortable, anxiety feels uncomfortable, but guess what? Just like anything in life, the more you have it, the more it gets used to it. So if we eat a lot of sugar, our body craves sugar, and the same thing happens to our brain. The more our brain was exposed to stress hormone growing up, the more chaotic our family life was when we were growing up, the more likely we are to perceive what is peaceful, what is calm, what is loving as just really boring. So if we 
find ourselves in a situation where everything seems to be going well, you know, we're studying, we're waking up in time, we're exercising, it's really boring, right? Let alone having a girlfriend or a boyfriend as like a upright, high integrity, good person, really, really boring. So we try to throw in some chaos into our lives by, you know, not paying bills on time, self-sabotage, um, not going to bed on time, screwing up our schedules, all of these things to try to hold ourselves back and create chaos in our lives. So all of a sudden there's that familiar surge of adrenaline again. So this is also very common and a lot of times people are just not aware of it. So they continue this pattern and not knowing why they do this. You also see it in relationships where people that grew up in chaotic families where the parents fight or they're abusive towards you, you also would seek out a partner that creates that familiar drama in your life because men or women that are too peaceful, too good at communication, you could perceive them as boring. So this is a sign that there's some healing to do still. Another one is inertia. Change is hard for everybody, right? So whenever you're trying to do something for yourself to better yourself, that is a change. You're not taking the status quo as being good enough. You're trying to improve yourself. You're trying to take yourself to a different level. That is a change and change is hard. Just like when you try to lose weight, your body you try to retain weight, try to conserve energy. It's just a, a general um, inclination for the mind and the body to reach homeostasis. It does not want to veer from what is familiar. And add on top of that, you also have friends and family who tries to keep you in place. This is very common, especially in a codependent relationship. For example, so the alcoholic's behavior is enabled by the codependent, which this person would you know, take care of the alcoholic when she's drunk, put her to bed, drag her um, to bed, or you know, cover up for her in general. And all of a sudden, the alcoholic goes to AA, starts to stop drinking. Then the spouse may feel that he is no longer needed. So in a way, the spouse is like regretting the fact or does not like the fact that the alcoholic is recovering because now he doesn't get to enjoy the rewards of being a rescuer. So this dynamic does exist. And sometimes you will see your friends and family or the people that profess that they care and love about you actually want to keep you in place because when you change, they have to change and change is not comfortable for them either. So just be aware of that. There are also... Maybe friends, I would tell you, they try to poo-poo on your dreams, for example. If you tell them that you want to go back to school, they'll tell you, oh, you're too old for that, right? You're too old for that, or you're never good at math. You can't do that. So they're putting their own limitation or their own limiting belief about you and your abilities on top of you. So at this point, you just have to really stay strong and true to your dreams and not let other people bring you down. Now, what are the things that we could do to combat all the onslaught of resistance that either comes from ourselves or from the environment around us? So I'll give you six tips. Number one is that um, you want to make sure that you limit the amount of time that you dedicate to analysis. So there is truth to analysis paralysis. Of course, doing research is useful, right? I personally love reading. If I could read all day by a beach, I would just do that. However, at the same time, I also know that the studying, the research is not the end result by itself, right? Life is not as fulfilling if whatever you're studying or researching or analyzing is not in some way shared for more good. So a researcher that does research and discovers an amazing cure but does not publish a paper does not turn it into a drug or some therapy that benefits other people, that's not entirely very useful. So if your goal is to actually um, affect change in the world, then it's really important that you set a limit on the amount of time that you spend in researching so you don't overthink a decision, you actually make progress. So don't make uh, researching a habit and have that hold you back. Now, um, Step number two is recognizing that you are not a child that is fighting your parents. So this is where choice comes in. When we're growing up, our parents would oftentimes impose certain things on us. For example, you sit down on that piano and practice for an hour. 
right? I hated that. That was done to me. I resented it. And even to this day, as an adult, when I sit in front of the piano, there's part of me that hates it because of that. And in these moments, I have to remind myself that, hey, you know, you may, now you bought that piano. You chose to sit down and you chose to practice. You chose to do it. So change your language from I have to, to I choose to. A lot of people say, you know, oh, I hate my job. I have to go to work. No, you chose to go to work. Why? Everybody chose to go to work because you're getting certain benefits. For example, you want the uh, the salary or the health insurance or the social aspect of coworkers or whatever it is. We have choices and we choose it. You weigh the costs and benefits and you choose to do things. So anytime that as an adult, we do something, it's a choice. Obviously, unless we're you know, in an enslavement camp, then we don't have a choice. A lot of times as children, we do not have a choice, but as adults, we do have a choice. So if we don't like something, we can also choose to do something different, but change that language. The third one is maintain good internal boundaries. So I limit, I uh, mentioned that before, which is do not allow research to eat up all your time. You have to set aside time to actually produce a result of the research. So for example, if you're a writer, don't research all day and use up all the time in reading other people's articles. You have to also write yourself. You're not going to miraculously become a better writer if all you do is you read. If you don't write, you're not practicing, you won't get better. So you have to set a limit. It could be any limit. For example, I would allow myself to uh, read three related books and then I must start to write an article about it, right? Whatever limit that may be. And then for the actual work, you also set a time limit. So for example, you could set a reward, which is I will watch a Netflix show after I do this task of writing. However, I have to write for at least X number of words or X amount of time, and then I can watch the show. So the rewards come after you do the needful, not during or not before. So this is called maintaining a strong internal boundary. Now, number four is to drop perfectionism. This is a very important. If we grow up in an environment where we're constantly being criticized, it's very easy to internalize that voice and then criticize ourselves as we become adults. And some of us turn into a, um, there's a drill sergeant in our head that is basically anything less than perfect is not good enough. And there is a saying that perfectionism is the best type of uh, torture, is literally the perfect torture. Why? Because by definition, perfection can never be achieved. So if you want to feel miserable, make sure that you criticize yourself for not being perfect. So how do you counter that? You counter that by telling yourself that it is absolutely expected and absolutely okay to do something messy. So just tell yourself, I will do it messy. I tell myself this all the time. I will draw a picture, I will do it messy. I will cook a cake, I'll bake a cake, I will do it messy. And in fact, it's messy. (laughs) That's just the way it is. But that's totally okay and totally expected. And just know that when you start moving, a work in progress, the movement itself will generate its own energy field. Movement begets movement. That's just Newton's first law, right? What remains not moving will stay not moving and what moves will keep moving. So you want to start moving. So the initial moving is hard. So take that small step. If you want to say, for example, start running, don't tell yourself, Hey, I'm going to run a 10 K in my first run. That's too much. Nobody can do that. Tell yourself that I'm going to put on my shoes and walk around the house, right? Set the goal super low. So the bar is low, make it mentally very easy for you to do. So that when you do that, you feel good and you can always do more if you feel like it. If you're a writer, the equivalent is to tell yourself that it's okay to write a shitty first draft. That's what drafts are for. Drafts are not for the world to see, it's for you to see. And your only responsibility is to put something down on paper. And the refinement can come later. But you start by just writing whatever comes to your mind. Now, number five is that you have to ban the inner critic. So this is basically, imagine in your head, there's a big sign that says, no inner critic allowed here. So you're not allowed to judge yourself. 
at least during the time that you are in the creation process. So whatever you create is good enough. Give yourself the opportunity to do it messy. So number six is um, remember that you have certain allies that you could count on. One is that you could be uh, do it stupid, do it be stubborn and relying on blind faith. So years ago when I was in grad school um, for a computer science program, I desperately needed some sort of scholarship because I did not want to rely on my parents to pay for my tuition, um, being that they're quite toxic. I want to cut all cords with them as soon as possible. However, I did not have a computer science undergraduate degree. And now that I'm in grad school and my, uh, my classmates are from MIT, they're from Berkeley, they're from Cambridge, amazing background. Of course, you know, I did not stack up well, given that I have no background, but because I was so desperate, I knocked on every professor's door. And what I told myself is I just need one yes. Just needed one yes. And I was also a foreign student to boot. But I got that one yes, which gave me the opportunity to be a teaching assistant. And that job, one job led to another, which paid for my tuition. And I was able to graduate with no debt. And that was a great way to start your life, right? Versus carrying a huge debt. So what that was for me was it was just blind faith, being stupid. I, I knew that I didn't stack up well. I did not know how poorly I stacked up until much later. I stacked up even more terribly than I initially anticipated, but not knowing this and what's even better is the professor didn't know it either. So they just thought that this kid is quite confident. She was obviously eager to teach. So let's give her an opportunity. So a lot of times just having some blind faith, just going for it will get you halfway there. Brian Chesky, who is the founder of Airbnb, uh, was once interviewed. Obviously, after he got famous, the reporter asked him, hey, you know, now that you know how many regulations, how many politicians, how many hotels that you have to fight to get Airbnb regulations through, would you have done it back then had you know all these complications that you know now? And he's like, of course not. I was so stupid. I knew nothing. I was just a kid. Had any of us, so me and my founder, had any of us had any inkling how bad things could get, none of us would have started this Airbnb thing. So sometimes you just have to do it stupid. People actually that know less have an advantage there because they don't know enough to be scared. So remember that. Persistent can overcome a lot of deficiencies, whether that's smarts, whether that's education, whether that's money. Being persistent can overcome a lot of that. Another one, and that's the last point, point number seven, which I would say is probably the most important. I know that I said six points, but it turned out to be seven points because this one is just too important not to mention it, is you want to reframe any kind of fear of failure as a good thing. Why? Because when we experience panic, it means that we're approaching something that's really, really important to our soul's evolution. In fact, the amount of fear and panic that we experience is proportional to how important something is to us. If it's not important to us, we wouldn't care. So the fact that we do and that we are afraid of failure means that it's really important to our soul's evolution. And then also to see mistakes as a way of learning. So a child could not learn to walk if they were never allowed to, to fall down on their butts. If the parents never let go, of holding the child, they will never be able to walk on their own. If we never remove the training wheels, how would you ever know if you could ride a bike, right? It's through these trying what doesn't work that we figure out what does work. So when we start to see failures as actually a success, as a way to figure out, oh, that doesn't work, so let me do a little course correction, then we actually start to see failure as a necessary step towards ultimately achieving our goal. I hope that you find today's conversation helpful and let me know in the comments if you have any ideas that you want to add to this topic. This topic is near and dear to me because I really want to empower everybody to achieve the life they want regardless of the upbringing that we have, even if it was not a supportive upbringing, even if our parents told us things that were not true, even if they did not allow us to develop into the person that we are. Now that we are an adult, we do have a choice and that is absolutely amazing and we should take every advantage of that. 
And um, please like and subscribe so that you get future notifications of any upcoming episodes. And if you like conversations like this, the ladies and I would love to invite you to join us in our women only coaching group where we have discussions with a group and then you get to learn from your peers. You hear about people's struggles as well as strategies like these that help them overcome it. It's really enjoyable to uh, socialize with like-minded people that are also interested in growing and becoming a better version of themselves. Until next time, take care.